And here you are, on Earth, 66 million years ago. It's one of the warmest periods in the planet's history. There are no ice caps yet. Everything is lush and green. Dinosaurs roam the Earth. Massive sauropods peacefully chew on flowering plants and trees, their young ones following closely by their side. Ah, You strain your neck to see their heads five stories above you. But that's when you see something else. A bright spot in the sky. A shooting star. Ah, make a wish. Wait a minute. The star grows bigger, brighter. Little do the mass reptiles know, today marks the beginning of one of the largest mass extinction events in Earth's history. Three quarters of life on our planet will be wiped out. Hey, we'll just hide over here and watch. Five seconds before impact. The meteorite rips a hole through our atmosphere like a needle in a balloon. The resulting supersonic shock wave starts to ripple around the globe. You'd hear it on the opposite side of the planet. The cosmic monster falling toward the Earth is the size of Mount Everest, at least 6 miles wide and weighing 460 trillion tons. The meteor is coming in hot and fast, 12 miles per second, heading right for the Yucatan Peninsula in present-day Mexico. At that speed, it could travel from LA to New York in under 4 minutes. Impact The mountain-sized asteroid smashes into the Earth. If only it had been anywhere else, life on this planet might look a lot different today. The Yucatan Peninsula, almost entirely underwater then, was one of just 8 places on the entire globe that would have let a giant space rock wipe out nearly all life on the planet meaning the asteroid only had a 13% chance of causing a mass extinction. And it happened to hit just the right spot. Well, aren't we lucky? At the point of impact, there's an explosion a billion times more powerful than even the most massive volcanic eruption. It looks like a new sun has appeared on our planet's surface. The meteorite digs into the Earth's crust and explodes into a million pieces. You can still see the scar it left. The Chicxulub crater is 93 miles wide and 12 miles deep. It could fit the entire state of Vermont and 24 Burj Khalifas stacked on top of each other. Something that leaves a scar like that has global consequences. The Earth ripples. The shock wave spreads for thousands of miles. The air blasts flatten forests in a second. Everything within striking radius is set ablaze. Nothing survives ground zero. But that was just the beginning. Smaller fragments of the meteorite, as well as parts of the Earth displaced by the giant hole it dug, go ricocheting out, reaching as far as Canada. The sky lights up with fireballs. They smash into the surface as well. Dinosaurs that weren't in the blast radius run in panic. But they have nowhere to hide. It's only about to get worse. The shock waves race across the sea. The tsunami is nearly a mile high when it hits the coast. The waves keep traveling, reaching the furthest corners of the planet. Even across the Pacific and up into the North Atlantic, they're five stories high. They wash away everything in their path. Besides the raging fires and skyscraper-sized tsunamis, the Earth is shaking from the worst earthquakes in history. A planet lush and teeming with life only a few minutes ago has turned into a nightmarish place. But this was only phase one. Five minutes after impact. Small rocks, dust, and ash rise high up into the atmosphere. These objects heat up and melt. They turn into hot lava that begins to fall to the ground like burning rain. Ten hours after impact. Fires continue to engulf everything in their path. Some surviving dinosaurs in North America try to escape to unknown territories. But now they're in dense swamps and can't escape. One month after impact. 15 trillion tons. Two and a half million times the weight of the Great Pyramid of Giza. That much ash and soot are released into the atmosphere. The cloud covers the entire planet and blocks out the sun. The Earth sinks into darkness. Surviving plants can't photosynthesize. Oxygen levels drop. Any animals left at this point are finally done in from lack of air. But the worst consequence was the extinction of photoplankton. The entire oceanic food chain starts to collapse like a house of cards. 
Many marine animals have lost their main source of food. Surviving animals on land also can't find anything to eat. There are no plants for the herbivores, and soon no herbivores left for the meat-eaters. And still, there's the acid rain. The Chicxulub meteorite hit a place where there was a lot of sulfur. The heat of the impact vaporizes the toxic gas instantly. It mixes with the air in the atmosphere. Acid rains fall all over the planet. The oceans become toxic. And if all that doesn't get them, the coal finally finishes off the job. With the sun blocked out, the burning fireball that is our planet starts to cool down. What's left in the wake? Plants are a little luckier than animals. Seeds and pollen are able to survive these harsh times. The first to slowly paint the charcoal planet green are ferns. The wind carries their seeds, sprinkling them across the Earth over 10 years. Then come the palms. The new planets produce oxygen and feed small mammals. Of the reptiles, only turtles and ancient ancestors of crocodiles can survive the temperature and acidity of the planet's waters. Unbelievably, some bird-like dinosaurs survive too. Other species of birds evolve and survive to this day. Sadly though, all terrestrial animals over 50 pounds in weight went extinct. It took much longer for the animal kingdom to recover. Larger mammals, such as rhinos, began to appear only 15 million years after the dinosaurs disappeared. Blue whales, the largest living creature this planet has ever seen, bigger than any of the dinos, only showed up a little over 4 million years ago. Did the dinos have a fighting chance? Scientists say that if the meteorite had hit in the deeper ocean, the story would have gone a lot differently. Yes, the resulting tidal waves would have been 10 times higher than the already massive ones that rippled across the planet. But even a giant mega-tsunami wouldn't be able to wipe out 75% of plant and animal life on Earth. What really did the dinosaurs in was the global blackout. If the meteorite had hit in deeper water, not the shallow sea of the Gulf of Mexico, there wouldn't have been so much dust and ash in the atmosphere. That dropped the oxygen levels and cut off the food chain from the very bottom. There's a theory that climate change and other conditions on Earth 66 million years ago would have still wiped out the dinosaurs, no meteorite necessary. It could be a supervolcano erupting and spewing out large amounts of sulfur and ash into the atmosphere. Perhaps the meteorite just sped up the inevitable. Now let's move on to a more interesting question. Could humanity survive a meteorite impact like that? Back then? Not a chance, obviously. But if something like that were to happen in our time? We have an advanced intellect and technology. We fill the cosmos with probes and satellites, so we know about any possible meteors headed straight our way. It wouldn't take us by surprise. Now, we might have to hide deep underground to avoid the blast wave and tsunamis. And you'd need enough food down there to last for at least a year. And don't forget your toilet paper. But with the right prep, humanity could stand a chance. The main problem after such an event is to survive the global winter when the ash covers the sky. But our species can handle it. Just ask anyone living in Omayakon, Russia. The town of 500 people holds a Guinness World Record for the coldest inhabited place on Earth. They've seen the thermometer read minus 90 degrees Fahrenheit. What about preserving plant and animal life? Our species has been working on that for a long time. There's a World Seed Storage Facility on Salvard Island. It's about 40 stories underground and can hold over 2 billion samples. The location was chosen because of the permafrost climate and low tectonic activity. Preserving all the planet's animals would be a tougher job. Perhaps genetic engineering, cloning, or something else would work. Herding them all down into a bunker? I mean, crocs, bears, and snakes included? Mm, I think I'd rather try my luck above ground, thank you. Big herds of dinosaurs run through the forest. The temperature rises rapidly, and everything behind them begins to ignite. Some dinosaurs get stuck in swamps and can't get out. Pterodactyls fly over their heads as they try to avoid the blast wave that will soon cover the Earth. This event happened about 66 million years ago. It wiped out almost every living thing on Earth. Birds and flying dinosaurs were just about the only ones who could survive the most massive extinction event ever. 
Hey, don't blame me, I wasn't around then. Let's go down their evolutionary tree to look at the world's first bird, Archaeopteryx. It was about the size of a modern raven, but it looked like a small dinosaur with feathers. It had many small conical teeth, almost like alligators. It's because Archaeopteryx was closer to reptiles than to birds. However, its brain was three times larger than that of these reptiles. Although it had wings with feathers, it could hardly fly like modern birds. Its shoulder joints didn't allow it to lift its wings above its back, so it couldn't make a full wing beat. Most likely, Archaeopteryx was capable of gliding flights with small wing flaps. Evolution has led to more evolved species capable of full flight. Pterodactyls. These guys had no feathers, but membranes made of skin and muscle. Its wingspan was about the length of a human leg. It could fly perfectly and catch fish and small animals. Although flying dinosaurs could easily outrun terrestrial predators like velociraptors and T-rexes, most of them didn't make it through the impact of a giant meteorite. Let's look at this event step by step to see how they got to our time. 10 minutes before the meteorite crash. A massive rock about the size of Manhattan Island is moving towards Earth in space. It weighs 460 trillion tons. That's like 3 trillion blue whales, the heaviest mammals that ever lived on Earth. And it's approaching our planet at 12 miles per second. At that speed, it could cross the Atlantic Ocean in just 4.5 minutes. That's twice as fast as our modern spacecraft could fly. 5 seconds before the meteorite crash. Ooh, this is getting tense. The Earth's gravitational force continues to pull the giant meteorite. It blows a hole in our atmosphere and creates a popping sound so loud you could hear it on the other side of our planet. All the animals on our planet wake up in a panic. They lift their heads up and see a huge rock that begins to burn through the air. Smaller fragments start to break away from the main meteorite. This fire is so bright that it shines almost like the sun. Flying dinosaurs and other ancestors of modern birds are the first to sense danger. They make a beeline to the sky and try to fly as far away from the impact site as possible to save their lives. The moment of impact. The colossal mass and velocity of the meteorite give it an enormous amount of energy. As soon as it touches the Earth, it causes an explosion of 150 trillion tons of TNT. The blast wave literally rips out chunks of our planet and throws them up. A huge wall of energy begins to move from the point of impact in all directions. It snatches the trees out with their roots and pushes them to the ground like dominoes. The shock wave completely wraps around our planet. This energy turns into heat. Everything around the impact site begins to ignite. Green jungles and trees turn into smoldering charcoal in seconds. The ground and rocks simply evaporate. The collision caused a massive earthquake. Some dinosaurs may have fallen into cracks that appeared in the ground. A strong earthquake caused a tsunami, with waves higher than the Empire State Building. Dinosaurs that weren't trapped in the burning forest were washed away by the enormous waves. The dinosaurs of North America tried to escape by running to the north, but the blast wave inevitably catches up with them. Flying dinosaurs have no problem with earthquakes or tsunamis. They fly high enough to avoid the giant waves. But they will have to contend with continuously falling meteorite debris. Five minutes after the meteorite crash. A meteor shower of giant rock fragments continues to fall to Earth. Some meteorites were the size of a car. Others were more like a large building. Ashes and dust rise into the air. Their temperature is so high that they melt and turn into liquid lava and then fall back to Earth, causing more fires. Meteor showers cause trouble for flying dinosaurs, too. They have to maneuver and dodge the falling red-hot rocks. The high temperatures are a huge problem for them because it might make them lose feathers. With no feathers, they aren't able to fly. 10 hours after the meteorite crash. The dinosaurs continuously ran north all this time. They found themselves in unfamiliar territory with many swamps. Giant dinosaurs like T. rexes have legs as long as an adult human's height. They have a chance to get through this terrain, but if they fell, they could never get back up. The smaller dinosaurs, like Triceratops, had short legs and couldn't grow through the dense swamps. One month after the meteorite crash. 15 trillion tons of ash were ejected into our atmosphere. A dark cloud blocked the sun, and the Earth was immersed in complete darkness. Surviving plants couldn't feed on the sun's energy and stopped producing oxygen. Surviving dinosaurs could hardly breathe because of the lack of air and a large amount of dust. The lack of sunshine in the sky made photoplankton disappear. Many marine animals were left without their only source of food. 
The dust and ashes in the atmosphere prevent our planet from getting heat from the sun, and the temperature here is beginning to drop. The place where the meteorite fell was rich in sulfur. This toxic acid evaporated at the time of the impact and formed in clouds. Now there are acid rains on Earth. Flying dinosaurs now have to hide from these rains. They have to stay in caves and can't go outside to get some food. So far, a large number of terrestrial and flying dinosaurs have survived. They come out to see the aftermath of the disaster. The site of the impact was in present-day Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula. The Chicxulub Crater is located here. It's about 93 miles wide, like half of all of Lake Michigan. And it's 12 miles deep. You could plunge the whole Mount Everest in there, and there would still be 6.5 miles of available space. It wasn't the impact itself that made the dinosaurs disappear. The fire destroyed most of the plants the herbivorous dinosaurs ate. With no food, their numbers dwindled rapidly. Predatory dinosaurs had nothing to eat either. Acid rain and the disappearance of photoplankton threatened all marine life. Even though birds managed to avoid the blast waves and tsunami, they were short of food too. About 80% of all birds didn't make it to the end of the extinction event. The problem was that all of the forests on Earth were wiped out. Most birds would nest and live in trees. Besides that, the forests were always full of food, from all kinds of ants and termites to flying insects and small mice. So only those species that lived on the ground and could fly well survived. Most likely, they fed on the seeds of small surviving plants. This habit made flying dinosaurs lose their teeth during evolution. Instead of jaws with a bunch of sharp teeth, they got long beaks to grab tiny seeds from the ground. Although Earth looks like a terrible place to live now, there's an evolutionary boom for birds. They have to travel long distances in search of food. Their wings get stronger. They also feel safe from predators who regarded them as food before. No T-Rex now catches a sleeping bird off guard. About a thousand years after the collision, the first dense forests appear. It gives another boost to evolution. A million years later, forests full of food are populated by the ancestors of modern mouse birds. And 65 million years later, in modern times, we have about 10,000 species of birds. Pigeons, crows, eagles, and hawks, even penguins. These are all descendants of the dinosaurs. But there were other survivors. Some alligator and crocodile ancestors were able to adapt to changing conditions. About 80% of turtle species managed to survive the mass extinction. And now, their descendants live among us. Snakes and lizards were also able to wait out the hard times in their burrows. Even some mammals, like monotremes, survived. This hedgehog-sized animal was able to continue to evolve. Many millions of years later, these mammals evolved into primates, which later gave life to modern humans. Much, much later came the iPhone. The problem with that asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs was not that it fell, but where it fell. This colossal space rock found the worst place where it could land. Also, the angle at which it hit the ground was the most unfortunate. If it had fallen vertically, there would have been less destruction. But it fell at such an angle that it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. After the disaster occurred, tons of soot started burning. 65 million years ago, only 13% of Earth's surface contained the right amount of sulfur and oil needed to form a colossal amount of soot. If the asteroid had fallen on the other 87% of the territory, dinosaurs could still be living today, but it hit the worst place and lifted a million tons of burning material into the sky. A cloud of incandescent particles covered the sky and set off on a journey across the mainland. Then. These particles settled on the ground and caused large-scale fires. Trees were burning and sending more soot into the sky. But the asteroid collided not only with rocks. It fell on the coast in a place where the seabed was filled with sulfate. As a result of the collision, it started burning, which caused the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The air became poisoned. It seems the dinosaurs didn't stand a chance. And now, let's imagine the asteroid falling in another place, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Huge waves flooded part of the land, but almost all kinds of dinosaurs survived. Or even better, the rock could have fallen somewhere in the desert and left behind a giant crater. That's all. Yes, several dinosaurs passing by wouldn't have survived the collision, but the situation wouldn't have been so critical in general. 
So, giant lizards remain dominant on our planet. They don't allow other animals to develop since Tyrannosaurus and other ferocious reptiles hunt mammoths and other ancient creatures. The population of mammals is decreasing. Velociraptors are fighting for territories with saber-toothed tigers and giant bears. A struggle for survival between dinosaurs and other animals begins. Then, the Ice Age comes, and some reptiles don't survive. Then, new players enter the field. Those are humans' early ancestors. Living side by side with dinosaurs is difficult. Lizards attack settlements and caves, so people have to build high walls for protection. By the way, the Tyrannosaurus poses less danger to people than you might have thought. According to the latest research, many creatures were able to run away from this monster. Yes, you probably saw how easily they caught up with cars in the movies, but it wouldn't be as scary in reality. Paleontologists and biologists have analyzed the strength of dino's bones and found out that the creature couldn't reach high speeds. The maximum it was capable of was running twice as slow as a field athlete. Thousands of years have passed. People have learned to live with dinosaurs. They've even managed to tame some lizards. They've domesticated herbivorous dinosaurs to develop agriculture. Triceratopses and bulls now plow fields together. Imagine farms swarming with Diplodocuses or Brachiosauruses. People climb their long necks and pick fruit from high trees. Stegosauruses protect pastures from wolves and velociraptors. Dinosaurs with shells, such as Ankylosauruses, help people across deserts. They, along with camels and donkeys, carry heavy loads. People share the planet with ancient lizards and live in harmony. The situation in the seas and oceans is much worse. Sea reptiles attack wooden ships and catch all the fish. Imagine that you're sailing to another continent with tons of grain, fabrics, fur, and other goods. And then a giant mosasaur appears on the horizon. It's one of the most powerful sea lizards. A great white shark looks like a small fish next to it. The creature could easily defeat a megalodon. And then it comes across a wooden ship. It bites into the deck and pulls the whole boat underwater. Water dinosaurs are the main obstacle to communication between countries. This slows the progress down for a hundred years. People built metal ships to withstand the attacks of the Mosasaur. And finally, they managed to establish sea connections. A similar problem occurs when the first planes take off into the sky. Imagine you're flying on a passenger Boeing. You look out of the window and see a pterodactyl. Ah, wait, it's impossible. These winged lizards aren't so fast but they can catch up with a helicopter or some old biplanes. This poses a serious threat to flights, so people install sound protection systems on board each aircraft. Pterodactyls hear irritating ultrasound from a distance and fly as far away from it as possible. People equip submarines and ships with the same sound shields. Then, after people have learned how to defend themselves from dinosaurs, another problem appears. Lizards are the kings of wildlife, so they displace all other animal species. Dinosaurs run across African savannas, and lizards with fur live in cold winter forests. Lions, wolves, and bears are not the rulers of the wild. Rhinos fight with Parasaurolophysis. Stegosauruses attack hippos and take away their territories. Venomous dinosaurs live in jungles. Lizards that can climb trees scare monkeys. Imagine a reptilian ape jumping from one branch to another. To save regular animals from extinction, people have to control the population of predatory reptiles. Huge parks and nature reserves appear in all countries. People transport dinosaurs there and separate them from other wildlife. Dinosaurs seem to be completely under control. When the danger caused by giant reptiles passes, people begin to breed smaller, harmless lizards. Someone buys a chameleon, and someone keeps a microceratus at home. There are dinosaur exhibitions. People take these creatures for a walk as if they were dogs. Some people take selfies with reptiles, go shopping, and sit in cafes with small lizards. Dinosaurs aren't formidable now. They're kinda cute. People ride horses, camels, Parasaurolophysis and Pachycephalosauruses. Of course, many have tried to tame Velociraptors, but failed. Those are dangerous reptiles and they don't know how to obey. Taming them is almost as difficult as taming an alligator. 
But dogs and cats are still more popular because they're more intelligent. The brain of a dinosaur is almost the same as that of a chicken. But who knows, if they had lived to this day, perhaps they would have evolved into smarter creatures. Just imagine if dinos were intelligent. In this case, people would have a big problem. Some scientists think that even if a meteorite hadn't destroyed the dinosaurs, they wouldn't have survived to this day. They needed to carry their own colossal weight at all times. It was an enormous load on their bones and joints. Most dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to survive the Ice Age with such characteristics, but smaller lizards might have succeeded. Fast and agile dinosaurs, such as Velociraptors and Pachycephalosauruses, would have survived. But in what form? Could dinosaurs have already evolved into something else? Look at the good old chicken. Many scientists believe it's a direct descendant of the formidable Tyrannosaurus. Somewhere deep inside the bird's DNA, there are genes that the dinosaur had. Yep, it's hard to believe, but look at the chicken's body structure and how it walks. Remove the plumage, cover the creature with scales, and give it toothy jaws instead of a beak. And now, you have a mini T-Rex in the coop. And by the way, not only chickens might be the relatives of giant lizards, many birds are dinosaurs' living descendants. Surprisingly, alligators, snakes, crocodiles, and monitor lizards are not as close to ancient reptiles as pelicans, storks, and other flying creatures. Over millions of years of evolution, the paws of dinosaurs turned into wings and toothy elongated jaws ended up as beaks. The genetics of birds is the key to understanding dinosaurs. Pelicans are similar to pterodactyls, ostriches to velociraptors. Perhaps many other animals also share some genes with ancient lizards. If the meteorite hadn't fallen, all dinosaurs would have evolved into completely different, unusual creatures. Scientists want to carefully study the DNA of birds and try to reverse evolution with the help of genetic engineering. They hope to breed dinosaurs out of eggs one day. But to do this, they need to find a specific genome that hasn't changed over tens of millions of years. It hides in the DNA, and it's not so easy to find it and extract it. Do you think we will see powerful reptiles by 2050? Mega Neuropsis was a giant dragonfly that lived on our planet almost 300 million years ago. It was about the size of a modern day falcon with a wingspan as long as your leg. It had long and sharp claws that it used to catch food and for protection. They could even grab small animals and carry them through the air. Their speed and maneuverability made them formidable hunters. Mega Neuropsis is the most giant insect ever found on Earth. Scientists believe it might have reached this colossal size because there used to be more oxygen in the air. There were other gigantic insects that lived before the dinosaurs too. Some ancient ants could grow to the size of a hummingbird. And if that wasn't scary enough, they could also spit acid, like something out of a movie. These ants lived in large colonies, and their anthills were several times bigger than the ones we see today and could resemble a bear's den. This thing is an Arthopleura, an ancient ancestor of the giant millipede. This monster dwarfed the last two animals, growing to the length of a car. It lived in rainforests, and it could move at great speed. Imagine being chased by one of these. Fortunately, Arthropleura weren't carnivores like today's centipedes. They only ate plants. Another reason the insects grew so big back then is that there was less direct competition. They could evolve and grow without being eaten by more successful animals. Bronto Scorpio lived about 400 million years ago and could reach three feet in length. That's 15 times longer than modern scorpions. And unlike modern ones, it had not two, but four claws. This amazing creature could also breathe on land and underwater. That's because it had both gills and lungs. It's believed that these guys were some of the first to evolve and change their habitat from water to land. Now, onto a far stranger marine animal, Anomalocaris. It's thought to be the very first predator to live on our planet. It was half the length of a human, their eyes had color vision, and they were likely the most advanced of any living organism half a billion years ago. They used their sharp claws and mouth parts for hunting trilobites crabs, and sea scorpions. It's possible that Anomalocaris was what eventually pushed crabs and scorpions onto the land. They might not look very similar, but Anomalocaris was also an ancient ancestor of modern crabs. 
Dunkleosteus was an enormous ancient fish. These guys were half the length of a school bus and weighed the same as a small car. They had no teeth, but evolved to use the bone plates on their jaws as a replacement, leading to their crazy appearance. This allowed them to have the biting power of a modern Mississippi alligator. Most impressively, it could close its jaw multiple times in less than a second. This created a powerful flow of water right into its mouth. Smaller fish would get caught in the current and pulled right into a Dunkleosteus's mouth. Their skull was heavily protected by bony armor. It was like it was wearing a helmet. This protected it from almost any strikes and made it the apex predator of its time. Achmonosteon is the ancestor of all sharks in existence, living around 340 million years ago. No one knows why, but in addition to the usual shark fin, it had something that looked like an anvil on its back. Another feature of the Achmonosteon was a massive spike on the underside of its body. It was very sharp and covered with many teeth. Tiktaalik were some of the first animals to set foot on land. It had gills and scales, like a fish, but it also had some of the features of land animals. It looked a bit like a cross between a fish and a lizard. Its front and back fins began to turn into limbs, so it could crawl along shorelines. And it developed lungs as it spent more time out of the water. This weird fish may be the ancestor of pretty much every modern land animal today, including us. Back to land, this is a dimetrodon. It looks like a lizard, but it's actually a synapsid, a close relative of mammals. It was the size of an alligator and had a giant sail on its back. Scientists aren't certain, but it's believed that the Dimetrodon used this sail to get heat from the environment faster. It also helped them camouflage themselves in the tall grass. These guys are often confused with dinosaurs, but they disappeared 40 million years before the first dinosaurs appeared. Over time, synapsids evolved into full-fledged mammals. And if we go further down this chain, we'll find out that humans evolved from these guys too. Dinocephalians. The name of these guys literally translates to scary-headed. This is because, in the process of evolution, their skulls became much thicker. These creatures were usually 19 feet long and weighed the same as a car. Some of them had long fangs like a saber-toothed tiger, but these giant lizards were herbivores. That doesn't mean that they were completely peaceful and docile, though. Scientists believe they fought within their species. They smashed their heavy foreheads into each other, like rams do now. Dinocephalians existed at a time when all our continents were still connected in a supercontinent, called Pangaea. Gorgonopsia looked a little like dinocephalians, only these guys were carnivores. They were about the size of a wolf, but they spent a lot of time in water too. They usually lived on coastlines and could dive into the sea looking for food. They were also the first predators that could run fast. This is one reason why Gorgonopsia ruled the world about 265 million years ago. Later, these species mysteriously disappeared, leaving the dinosaurs to dominate the Earth. The cause of the mass extinction about 240 million years ago is unknown. But the second event that caused the extinction of 95% of all living organisms on Earth was a giant meteorite. The oldest tree remains are 385 million years old. Archaeologists found them inside a rock, where there were traces of the roots of many species of trees. These ancient trees evolved and began to turn the carbon dioxide in the air into oxygen. Gradually, they created the atmosphere we have now. This is the oldest winged insect in the world, Rhine Agnatha. It's about 400 million years old, and there's still debate about the way it lived. Supposedly, it fed on plants, but it also might have eaten other animals. The oldest species of millipede is Pneumodesmus pneumani. It may have been the first living organism to breathe on the barren earth around 400 million years ago. This little guy was only as long as a seed, but we only have one fossil, so they might have grown a bit bigger. Pneumodesmus might be a distant relative of all the millipedes and centipedes that exist today. The farther we go back in time, the more bizarre the living organisms look. 480 million years ago, Aegirocassus coasted through the ocean. For its time, it was the largest animal on the planet, reaching 6.6 feet in length. 
Fortunately for other sea creatures, it wasn't a scary hunter. It ate the same way that the blue whale does today, swallowing loads of water so it could catch all the tiny things living in it. Dickinsonia lived 550 million years ago. These floating ovals varied a lot in size. Some could be the size of a fingernail, while other species were as big as a kitchen plate. The largest Dickinsonia may have been as wide as a stingray. These animals are so primitive that they didn't even have a skeleton. Some scientists thought it wasn't even an animal, but a fungus. But that was later disproven. Charnia was another animal that scientists originally thought was a plant. They believed that it was just the leaf of something like a fern. They realized that it was an animal when it was found that Charnia lived deep underwater, where photosynthesis is impossible. These guys swam near the bottom of the sea and fed on nutrients from the water. Instead of a traditional digestive system, these things had filters. They ran water through them to catch food in it, like the Ajirocassis. The first living organism is thought to have appeared about 4.2 billion years ago. When the oceans first formed, they were filled with things needed for life to exist. Under high temperatures, this matter began to interact and join together, forming the first living organism. This is why we look for planets with liquid water. We know life on Earth started with water, so many people believe that water is the most important factor in the origin of life.